Oxford. Oxford, I'm very honoured to have been asked by the Bonavera Institute um, to chair the panel um, and to introduce the speakers for um, the um, book launch tonight um, of the very interesting book um, that's been published on anti-discrimination law in civil law jurisdictions. Um, I think the uh, running order we're going to have is that we're going to start with um, Barbara and the author of the book, Barbara Havelkova, um, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law in Oxford and a Fellow of um, St Hilda's College, um, who has also acted as a, an advisor to the um, Prime Minister of the Czech Republic on in issues of gender and law and has produced this very valuable book. So thank you very much, um, Barbara, for being here this evening. And then we're going to hear from uh, Matthias uh, Merschel, who's the Associate Professor and Head of the Department and Chair of the Human Rights Law Programme at the Legal Studies Department of the Central European University. And then we'll have a discussion and I'll open up to the discussion um, uh, where we will hear from three uh, extraordinarily eminent uh, human rights and equality law specialists. Um, uh, Professor Sandy Fredman, the Rose Professor of Law uh, here at the University of Oxford um, and Chair of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. Um, Professor Cato Regan, um, the Director of the Bonavero um, Human Rights Institute and also a, a former judge of the Constitutional um, Court of South Africa and a host of other um, impressive appointments and um, judicial appointments uh, in the rest of Af Africa and elsewhere. And finally, Callum um, Okaneda, um, Professor of Constitutional Law and Human Rights Law at UCL. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing you um, all and thank you very much um, for taking the time this evening. Barbara, do you want to tell us about your book? You're muted. Thank you. Yes, I just realized. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, everybody, the panelists and everybody who's listening in for joining us. Um, so the book really started with my own research into Czechia and, and reading a little bit around continental civil law jurisdictions, attitudes to anti-discrimination law, which I realized were not particularly friendly and warm. Uh, there were problems with adoptions. A lot of the anti-discrimination acts which were implementing EU law directives came about quite late. Uh, the Czech one came in, in uh, 2009, which was several years after accession and when the obligation was kicking in. Uh, and the same was happening in Germany. There was a lot of both uproar among constitutional lawyers and private lawyers against it. Uh, but I realized that there was relatively little critical analytical work done on this, especially in, in the English language. So there were some you know, people writing about it, perhaps in domestic jurisdictions, but there was no conversation between common lawyers and civil lawyers about the subject. So um, I decided this was worth exploring. Uh, we did a workshop in Oxford and the book was the result of that. Now in the, I'll, I'll hand over to Matthias, who's just going to speak briefly about some of the main findings, which we um, included in, in what we think is quite a sort of a substantive uh, introduction to the book where we summarize some of the findings across the jurisdictions. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, it's nice to see everyone. Welcome to the audience as well. So in some ways, you know, my trajectory came from a slightly different country. So also being looking at anti-discrimination law in Italy and more sort of Germany as well, but still civil law jurisdictions in France. And so it overlapped in some ways with some of the things that Barbara was saying. So ultimately, we started with this hypothesis that overall, it seems that anti-discrimination law seems to be an irritant or something of a legal irritant for civil law jurisdictions, something that has been imported from common law and then sort of like landed there. And so that was our starting hypothesis. And overall, the finding would be that this still is true to some extent. But then when we started looking at the various um, individual contributions that we received and that we uh, that we uh, read and, and uh, edited, some nuances seem to come up. And just very briefly to come up that this picture seems a little bit more different when you start looking at various aspects. One of them is time. So times in some countries, we see that things have changed. Germany and France seem particularly hostile to some extent and now less so as far as some of the authors say. Um, which area of law as well seems to be influencing in which way there is really a legal irritant, yes or no. So that public law seems to be quite resistant as opposed to employment law, where it seems to be easier to locate anti-discrimination law and, um, and also indirect discrimination. It doesn't necessarily come as a surprise because even when you look at the United States, you find that indirect discrimination has found its space uh, 
in employment law, but the US Supreme Court has refused to extend at least some of the logic to the interpretation of the 14th Amendment. So that, that those nuances possibly take place in common law jurisdictions as well. Then as well, when you're looking at which concepts we're talking about, depending on the concept, you find that the picture is not as negative as you might expect. So concepts we talk about direct, uh, indirect discriminations, quotas, harassment, reasonable accommodation. So that also influences the way in which this really is true, that it is a legal irritant or not. The grounds of discrimination, overall, we find that possibly disability and interestingly age as well seem to be more receptive than, for instance, race. So case of race discrimination, there seems to be quite some issues in civil law jurisdictions overall. And last but not least, uh, this idea that anti-discrimination law jurisdictions are hostile seems to be nuanced depending on the actors that we look at. So if you're looking at courts, one picture might emerge. But if you're looking at through the lens of equality bodies, for instance, a different picture emerges because then you find out that possibly Surprisingly, certain countries do fairly well. Hungary and Czechia, actually, to some extent, the equality bodies have been doing quite a good job. And other countries, the equality bodies uh, that have been created, like Germany and Italy, are fairly weak. So, so a more nuanced picture is what emerged from the combined uh, contributions that we collected in this volume. And I'm going to take over. Sorry, am I muted again? No, I'm not. Excellent. Uh, I'm going, just going to take over speaking a little bit um, about what we uh, identified as explanatory factors from, from this. And we always had this idea of legal and extra legal reasons for why, why some countries in relation to some concepts, et cetera, were doing better than others. But we eventually realized that it's much, much more useful to speak about a spectrum. So starting on the legal, there will be four, four factors that I'll speak about. Starting on the legal spectrum, we found that pre-existing law and its interpretation played quite a prominent role. Just to give one example, in some countries, race discrimination was dealt with as a criminal matter in France, for example. That imbued this idea of discrimination with an idea of intent or, or motive. And that has, in some jurisdictions, hindered the sort of no-fault understanding of anti-discrimination law that is actually what the EU expects the countries to do. The second uh, point which we found was very important was what we called institutional choices and mobilization. So what type of equality body do you have? Uh, what kind of competences they have? But not just the formal competences, but it often also just depended on serendipity, serendipity like a very strong pro-human rights person or not. Uh, NGOs, their formal, uh, the formal standing given to them uh, in law, but also again, their funding uh, and things like that. Finally, also trade unions, which some uh, of our authors have noted have been quite ambivalent about anti-discrimination law in civil law jurisdictions. The third factor are constitutional foundations and legal narratives. Um, we found here that there are some quite prominent notions in civil law countries that often don't exist uh, the same way uh, in the common law countries, like uh, the understanding of freedom of contract or if even a constitutional right to freedom to run a business uh, in, in Germany or in Czechia, which, which really have been always sort of uh, pushing against anti-discrimination law. And we often found them being balanced in, in constitutional litigation. Or in, in France, for example, uh, French republicanism and this idea of sort of a unified hom hom homogeneous state which has then made uh, you, the use of anti-discrimination law difficult because it's seen actually as fragmenting rather than, rather than as pointing out actual real fragmentation that exists. Um, and finally, even sort of very deep, profound uh, political or uh, ideological foundations um, can play a role. And here we sort of started a discussion um, about this more individualistic attitude to problem solving in common law countries and individual rights-based approaches versus more collective solutions in civil law ones. So some of the issues we, we, we realized that are addressed by anti-discrimination law in common law countries are often addressed by social policy or tax policy um, in, in uh, civil law countries, but that also then again leads to some amount of backlash because it's seen as some groups being singled out in a situation where the political discourse is used to sort of 
collective general solution. So that's very briefly uh, the four factors that we kind of mapped on a legal through extra legal spectrum. And that's all from us. And we very much look forward to your comments, discussion and questions. Thank you. I'm absolutely dying to ask a question, but I'm not going to. I'm going to hand over to Sandy Fredman and see what she's got to say. <laughs> well, hello and uh, hello to everyone out there. And um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's, it's lovely to be here. And I am so thrilled to see the publication of this edited collection and warmly congratulate Barbara and Matthias on this really pioneering work and also all the contributors for their fascinating contributions. So just looking backwards, you know, Barbara began her M stud with me a long time ago now. And that's when we first began talking about the difficulties and blind spots, really from both sides. What what I didn't see about her uh, experience and what she didn't see about the common law, although Barbara was always in the unique position of being able to straddle both sides and have perspectives from both sides. Um, but particularly the blind spots when it came to implementation of EU anti-discrimination law initially into Czechia and other similar post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And Barbara's DFO went on to examine the continuities and discontinuities in Czechia itself, but her work, as we know, has had vast resonances for other countries in the region. But I myself at that time had been deeply involved in evaluating the implementation of the new EU directives after 2000. Um, I was one of the directors of the EU Commission's network of experts on non-discrimination law. And we were, and Colin was also part of that. And we were in a sense, um, guiding or overseeing or providing expert input into the implementation of the directives all across Europe. And we were encountering the kind of things that Matthias and Barbara have been talking about. Germany, for example, was very slow, very dilatory in implementing. And there was, um, again, a great need to have some kind of understanding of what were these barriers? Why was um, it difficult to, to transplant, to um, implement, to gain, as it were, social traction for the EU directors at that time were introducing uh, non-discrimination or in relation to age, uh, disability, uh, race, gender, uh, gender had already been there, um, religion and belief and uh, sexual orientation. So at that, so Barbara's insights were all enormously valuable. Um, and I was so extremely, um, I was really thrilled to see much later on that she and Matthias were um, planning this project to bring together um, contributors from all over Europe to, uh, to cast light on the kind of different perspectives, the unsaid, often unsaid and unnoticed because everyone comes at it with their own framework of reference. Um, so to have gathered contributors from, I think it is 14 different countries, all of which are providing crucial insights is really a great achievement. Um, I'd just like to pick up two kind of, I guess, more substantive things. Um, one which Matthias mentioned, which is that one of the things that is particularly striking, which emerges from the perspectives is the involvement of equality bodies and that was an, an aspect of the race directive, which um, was kind of there, but obviously was an important one because that's one of that that's, that's gotten a lot of steam within European countries. And I mention this because um, a key issue, which is often not confronted between common law and civil law systems is the difference in adjudication models. Um, so in the last few years, I've done several reports for the European Commission's network of experts on anti-discrimination law. And part of this process involves formulating questions to send to country experts who are based in all the countries and collating the responses. And I learned a lot then about how the same question 
is interpreted so differently in different jurisdictions and actually interpreted quite differently from how I understood them, which really required me to think again about what fixed frameworks I was coming into these very different um, situations. Um, and in particular, this came out in two reports that I did. The report on intersectionality in particular, on intersectionality in particular, if you just looked at kind of tribunals or any kind of adjudicatory systems, you would hardly see anything. You would hardly see any appreciation of intersectional issues. But if you looked at what equality bodies were doing, they were actually spotting and addressing intersectionality in, in, in a much broader sense, partly, I think, because they were not stuck in um, strict, um, strictly siloed uh, adjudicative of ways of thinking. Um, so if we hadn't asked the question about equality bodies, if we hadn't had these insights into these different structures, we, we might have really missed some of the things that were happening in Europe at the time. Um, so this also opens our eyes to seeing, to, to requiring us to rethink the limitations of traditional adjudication and the importance of alternatives. Um, this was even clear in, in, in another report that I did, actually an earlier report, which was on proactive equality duty. So this was a report on the extent to which we could actually move away from adjudication bodies and develop proactive duties on equality. And again, I went into this with, with the kind of assumption that either you have adjudication or you have, which is retrospective, you know, um, adversarial, etc., and slow, or you have proactive duties on public bodies. But all, all through Europe, there are a whole range of different institutions, all the way from equality bodies to other kinds of tribunals, um, to other ways of, of resolving these issues. So it, it was, again, so important to be able to uh, recognize um, these institutional differences between civil and common law um, perspectives. So um, again, I was I was very uh, appreciative of the kind of conversations that we had had, that Barbara and I had had early on, and that we were continuing to have amongst the the, the experts on the Equality Network. Um, but actually, as well as the differences, I think I was also struck by the similarities in some of the challenges. And Matthias already mentioned that. Um, actually concepts like indirect discrimination, direct discrimination are very difficult and many courts in, in many places in common law as well as civil law jurisdictions are uh, at best partial and sometimes defective in applying those concepts. So I think that is um, more of a continuity than one might originally have thought and especially, you know, Barbara and I have had these discussions about why it is, for example, in Czechia that concepts like indirect discrimination are, are, are not um, taking as much root. But I think that's that's much more widespread as we, than uh, much more widespread than we might imagine. But one of the key things, and this is the last point that I would make, which I was again struck by by looking at the substantive points made in the book, was um, the difference between equality and and what you call what Barbara and Matthias in the introduction called grounds-based discrimination. So the right to equality and the right to non-discrimination. And we've often discussed this in our classes, in the classes that Barbara and I run, uh, as to what is the right to equality. And um, the insight that comes from the civil law jurisdiction seems to be that equality is much more about consistency, more like a, a non-arbitrariness a non standard. Uh, whereas coming from the UK, which never had a constitutional equality guarantee, um, it always started off with non-discrimination and grounds-based, which is slowly, incrementally increased. But actually, when you look even more deeply, this pattern isn't all as clear because the US, the 14th Amendment, starts with equality and from equality, we develop some kind of grounds-based um, tiers of scrutiny. And, of, and in the other country, in, in other countries like Canada, South Africa and India, we have both equality and non-discrimination and they complement each other. And now in the UK, since 2000, or yeah, since 2000, 
We've also had the conception of equality through the public sector equality duty and the notion of equality of opportunity. So these in intersecting patterns remain enormously fascinating and important. And there's a huge amount more which we could which could be discussed in relation to the various chapters, which I'm sure I'll refer to often in my research. So thank congratulations again to Barbara and Matthias and all the other contributors and I'll I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank you very much, Sandy. And I must say, if you described a work of mine as pioneering, I'd probably just retire happy. So it's a great compliment. Um, and now I think we're going to turn to Kate O'Regan, who of course comes to this from a um, South African law perspective, principally. Kate. Um, I'm happy to go next, Callum. Is that all right with you? Oh, sorry, is it Callum next? That's my fault then. Would you, do you want to go Callum next? Sorry, we're going to go Callum. Who comes to it from, a, from, a, from, a, from a European perspective, Callum. <laughs> and Brilliant, thank you. Perspective, actually, as well, yeah. Yes, thank you, Helen. Um, like Sandy, I came at all of this from a, from a similar starting point, I think, that um, I was a member, I was the UK Rapporteur for the European Network of Anti-Discrimination Experts in the middle 2000s, when the directives first, when the 2000 directives first came into force. And um, it was absolutely fascinating going to these conferences in Brussels with legal experts from all over the 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 the, the, the states of the EU, and suddenly realizing that the Anglo-American template defining things in extremely broad terms that had emerged in the field of discrimination law from the seventies, eighties, and nineties, um, actually was the, the, that template, that way of thinking, the way of conceptualizing of anti-discrimination law problems and seeing them through a particular lens, reflected a way of thinking and understanding about these issues, which was quite radically different from alternative ways in thinking of understanding about these issues that you would encounter in that room in Brussels and more generally in conferences, seminars, government meetings across the EU. Um, and I think this came as, I think, a shock to quite a lot of people, in particular those of us in sort of perhaps insular Anglo-American perspectives. But also, I think the, the reason why this differentiation wasn't as anticipated, perhaps, as it should have been, is because the development of gender equality law in the context of EU law had actually proceeded relatively smoothly. Now that may seem quite odd to those of you who were there in the battles of the 70s, 80s and 90s, but actually um, in a way all European countries, including the UK to some extent, even if it was an early leader, came to the problems of um, gender equality law at the same time. Um, seminal cases like Decker and Barber and these other major Court of Justice of the EU precedents had a, had a, had a, had a significant impact simultaneously upon the legal systems of the whole EU. And gender equality became a, a sort of common project that developed together, where the Netherlands and Sweden and Austria and subsequently the Central and Eastern European countries were dealing with some of these issues at a sort of similar pace as say the UK or Ireland. So indeed, and, and, and because of course the gender equality framework was to a large extent being carried over in the 2000 directives, similar approach to direct discrimination, harassment, indirect discrimination, victimization, and so on. The assumption was that this relatively smooth common experience in gender equality would perhaps be carried over to um, these new grounds. Um, that hasn't been the case. And I think it became quite early it became quite obvious early on that things were going to be a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting in the academic sense of the term, meaning really quite difficult and complex and messy. Um, the, um, it, 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 for example, it became rapidly clear if you were looking in the mid 2000s at the complex and difficult process of the Germans um, introducing their implementing legislation for the 2000 Framework Directive and the 2000 Race Equality Directive with intense discussions about the impact of the significant expansion of EU law on contractual freedom of contract and the, 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 the constitutionally guaranteed right to engage in a business and to operate with autonomy in the sphere of commercial life. All constitutionally recognized entitlements 
suddenly been substantially restricted in, 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 in ways that hadn't yet been fully recognized within German law, and, and so which were experienced to some extent as an alien intrusion. Um, so the process was difficult, and perhaps more difficult than many would have assumed. Um, and that did lead to lots of speculation, lots of discussion about how common law and civil law systems um, would vary. Um, and that discussion has gone on. And I, and I have to say, you, 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 you do encounter quite radically different ways of, of visualizing some of these issues and debating and discussing some of these issues in different contexts. I spent 10 years in a slightly different context, the European Commission on Social Rights, but equality issues would come up consistently in that, in that context as well. And again, 15 colleagues of us, there were 15 colleagues on the committee with me, all from different member states, and not member states, uh, sorry, not EU member states, Council of Europe member states, but from a, a spectrum of states all across Europe and the issue, for example, of whether discrimination had to have an intentional component triggered quite radically different responses from, um, from the experts around the table. Okay, So it's been an interesting 15 years or so to see these, these tensions develop. Um, but it has been interesting as well that, as Matthias and uh, Barbara have said, this hasn't followed a sort of linear common law, civil law pattern in many ways. In fact, in many ways, we've seen a much more uh, differentiated picture with significant variations e existing across um, different aspects of the of the of the EU and even beyond in, in Council of Europe states that aren't within the EU. Um, all of which is a very long-winded way of leading into my comments, what I want to say about this book. Now, I'm writing a review of this for a, for an, uh, a, a law journal, so I'm going to save all my witticisms and my uh, clever academic points for the, uh, for the big review. Um, but I just wanted to say, when I heard that Barbara and Matthias were putting together this book, I was absolutely thrilled. It seemed to me a project that was begging to happen, a project that was going to fill what to me had become a gaping hole in the literature. And um, I, I was at the conference in 2018 in Oxford where initial papers were delivered and it was one of the richest two days I think I've spent discussing discrimination law. And the book has arrived and it has delivered on all its promise. It's, it's an absolutely fascinating set of snapshots of how anti-discrimination law has been applied, applied in multiple EU states, lots of interesting lessons, um, and, and has managed to capture the diversity of thought and opinion around the issue. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's an interesting combination of both, in, for some chapters, really close, fascinating detail to the specific dynamics that play in particular national legal systems, and then other chapters which pull back a little bit and give us a wider picture of values and framework and some of the normative tensions that exist. So it's an incredibly rich collection. You can all wait for my review to uh, read everything in detail, but it, 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 it comes highly recommended. I can give you a sneak preview. Um, I will very briefly make some a couple of points about what struck me coming out from the book. Um, first of all, there is an intellectual skepticism about aspects of anti-discrimination law, which is deeper rooted to some extent in continental European countries, in certain continental European countries, than is necessarily the case elsewhere. Um, in particular, Barbara mentioned the collective individual dynamic. There is a suspicion, for example, in, 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 in certain theoretical quarters, in Germany in particular, and I'm thinking about a commentator like Alexander Solnek, or indeed Wolfgang Schreck, who very prominent sort of left commentators in Germany who are deeply uneasy with what they see as the individualistic tendencies of anti-discrimination law, and indeed what they see as the US-style identity politics that comes in its wake. And I think that's had some impact on the reception of anti-discrimination law and complicated the picture. Um, there's also, I think, been rather interesting dynamics playing out differently in different states as to conceptualizations of um, the status of anti-discrimination law and the imperative force associated with anti-discrimination law norms and, and to what extent they require a, a, a rejigging transformation of 
for example, collective agreement. So we've had the Danish Supreme Court in the Agios case, effectively, very politely, but effectively refusing to give effect to a judgment of the Court of Justice of the EU because they saw it as, as eroding the legal certainty of a, of a previously determined collective agreement. Um, that's fascinating in all sorts of ways, but I think underlying it is a sort of view that the status of age discrimination is perhaps not as normatively demanding as the privileging of collective agreements and collective labor bargaining that has historically had a constitutionally recognized position within the Danish context. So there's interesting dynamics there which play out very differently in different states. Um, Barbara and Matthias have both mentioned the fascinating tensions that have tended to arise in the constitutional public law dimension. And which we can perhaps discuss um, discuss further, um, but a, a constant problem which I I, I think is, is is surfacing over and over and is very is very well discussed in quite a few of the chapters is the question to what extent intent should play a role, and there's a certain irony here, and this would certainly, as Matthias has said, inoculate you against any tendency to draw a simple distinction between common law and civil law systems. Because of course the question of intent looms very large in the original state where contemporary anti-discrimination law first emerged in, in, in a, in a well-developed form, which is the United States. So that would inoculate you against tendencies to emphasize the civil common law distinction too much. Um, let me conclude having talked about difficulties in talking about really interesting positive lessons to be learned about enforcing anti-discrimination law that I've learned from this book um, in particular. Some of the individual chapters um, are eye-opening in terms of um, novel and innovative ways of enforcing, giving effect to anti-discrimination law, reaching parts of daily life and employment practice in particular, which frankly the UK and other countries with normally well-developed anti-discrimination systems can struggle with. Matthias's chapter, for example, on the use of racial harassment provisions in the Italian context is absolutely fascinating on this point. Um, Tatina Lonan's chapter on reasonable accommodation in the Netherlands and the way they've developed a much more um, a much more formalized reasonable accommodation framework to, 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 to cater for minority religious beliefs is again fascinating from a doctrinal point of view, if nothing else in the UK context. So there are um, positive lessons to be learned, um, as well as points of concern and tension. And this book really is, is incredibly rich. So it's not just, so reading it was fascinating because not alone did it explain, help explain to me some of those tensions I first began to pick up on 10, 15 years ago and have kept on running since, but they've also, I think, um, forced me not alone to understand what's happening out there, so to speak, but also have to some extent forced me to rethink some of the assumptions cliches, stereotypes, received wisdom that you get from when you operate and are brought up, so to speak, within the Anglo-American way of thinking about these approaches. So it's an incredibly rich collection, highly recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Callum. And it, it is um, enriching and exciting to share ideas across jurisdictions and to to, to, to see where the where the overlaps in the Venn diagram are and challenge your own um, thoughts. I hope very much that um, practitioners as well as academics will will think about this because it will inform their practices in creative ways. Um, Kate, do you want to? Um, yes, thanks, thanks, Helen. Helen. And um, and like um, like Sandy and Cullum, I, I, it was um, a really wonderful book to read. I was very sorry not to have been able to have been at the at the conference in in, in Oxford, and so very delighted to see this in in print. Um, of course, I come at it from a very different perspective to Sandy and Cullum coming at it as a sort of South African lawyer, also. Um, borrowing many of the ideas of Anglo-American equality law, but in a very different setting with a mixed uh, legal system, not purely um, a civilian system, it's a common law system in many senses, but built on, on Roman Dutch law. So um, a kind of different eye on this. And although um, the kind of the, the lens of this book is on the idea of how does um, anti-discrimination law fit into civilian systems, I think a lot of the insights and 
um, and uh, thoughts that come through the book, you might find have great application in how does anti-discrimination law fit in a system, for example, in uh, the developing world in Africa, that a lot of these issues seem to be uh, very similar. I really liked the two uh, very clearly stated research questions, um, which was that the book was going to ask how does um, anti-discrimination law fit into these civilian systems in Europe? And secondly, um, the question of what are the factors that influence it? And in sort of commenting on it, I thought I might, there were two sort of aspects of this that really stuck out for me. One was the importance of institutions and the other was the importance of legal culture. Um, and so, starting to think a little bit about what insights I got in relation to institutions, although lawyers often start when we think about institutions by talking about courts, by and large, this collection talks about a whole range of institutions other than courts. Uh, not that there aren't commentary on courts, for example, uh, Yanakuru and Gulas's account of the Greek experience with courts is, uh, is a depressing, um, but very much court oriented account. But the first institution that struck me was the importance of legislatures. Now, almost in every case uh, um, in, in this book, um, anti-discrimination principles have been drawn through from the EU directive. So there's a very common source of norms. And yet several of the authors comment on the manner in which the um, EU directives, had, as it were, had been uh, uh, nationalized or made international law in each of the different systems. So Michael Varasa talks about the cumbersome transposition of the EU directives into German law. And that's cumbersome not only because of the way in which the mechanisms and the law worked, but also because of the attitudes of parliamentarians to the project. And I think it illustrates that actually how parliamentarians think about this is important. And here again, we come up against some of the things that both uh, Cullum and Sandy have talked about, which is, for example, organized interests who are not persuaded that individualized remedies are the way to address deep patterns of social disadvantage. And so that can come out of the trade union movement, out of the left movement, but it can also come out of a, a kind of a Christian Democrat, liberal pro-market attitude and, um, and, and Rasa comments about how, how that process of uh, legislating in Germany uh, was particularly cumbersome. Um, and on the other hand, Matthias's piece on Italy talks about the rather cut and paste job that was done in Italy and sort of just take in the directives, just put it in and not a lot of thought. And again, not a lot of apparent legislative commitment to this. We've just got to do this because this is what's being required of us. Um, so I think this is something we often don't talk about in comparative law. We tend to look quite quickly at what courts are doing. But in fact, I think what legislators do and how embedded it is and how, um, how much popular com conversation and engagement that is with the process of equality lawmaking struck me reading these pieces might be something that's worth looking at. Then secondly, and again, both Sandy and Cullen have talked about the importance of equality bodies. And several of the articles talk about the significance of equality bodies. So Susanna Burry and Tisha Lunen talk about the Dutch Institute for Human Rights, and uh, which is, you know, in many ways to an Anglo-American uh, uh, kind of lawyer, uh, quite a surprising body. It's, um, it's very cheap, it's very accessible, uh, in, in, in many cases, decisions aren't binding, but it's nevertheless ex extraordinarily influential because it is accessible. Now, certainly we don't have anything of that sort in South Africa. We tend to work on a legal model of binding decisions, try to make it accessible, but actually generally it's not. So I, I think that was very interesting. And similarly, there's an account um, uh, by uh, some authors about the Austrian Equal Treatment Commission. Um, and then there's also Matthias's uh, discussion about the race equality body in Italy. All of these accounts show how important these equality bodies are. Um, there's also an intersection here and uh, between labor law and equality law, which comes out both in terms of kind of the way institutional arrangements work. So we've talked a little bit about collective bargaining, uh, to some extent a resistance of trade unions at times to individualized mechanisms. Uh, but also the significant importance of employment courts. So there's a very interesting piece um, uh, on France by Marie Merca Bruno, who talks about uh, indiscriminate, indirect discrimination in, in France. And again, this, of course, inevitably institutions are going to vary dramatically across systems, no matter that the norms are the same, the institutions uh, will differ. And that sort of brings me to the legal culture uh, aspect of it. 
Um, I was very taken with the use by Marco Grosso, and it's picked up in the introduction by um, Barbara and Matthias, on Sal Sally Engel Mary's kind of fourfold approach to thinking about legal culture. Um, the internal or, uh, legal culture, which is within the legal profession, the practices and ideologies of the legal profession, the external uh, legal culture, which is the attitude of the public to law, but then also the questions of mobilization and, um, and uh, legal um, uh, consciousness, which are about how law uh, is used and recognized in the broader community. And it does, does seem to me uh, reading through all uh, the various contributions, how important these elements are in determining how anti-discrimination law gets um, gets implemented and how it becomes effective. So um, there's, uh, again, um, Varasa's comment that there was no culture really of anti-discrimination litigation in Germany. And then you come across the comment uh, by Suzanne Burry and Tisha Lunen of the long history in the sense of the role of the um, the predecessor to the Institute for Human Rights um, in, in the Netherlands being an important factor in the kind of cultural response um, to anti-discrimination law. And then Laura Carlson's account of Sweden, where she, no culture of individual litigation, a corporatist collectivist model, going you know, right back to the, um, the kind of corporatist arrangement between the unions and uh, employers in the, in the 1930s. Um, and, and of course, Barbara's own um, account of the, this distinction between a general principle of equality in um, Czechia and um, versus anti-discrimination law, which Sandy also commented on. So um, it does seem to me that, uh, you know, these four criteria of legal culture, uh, aspects of legal culture are terribly important. The role of a civil society, NGOs and trade unions, for example, in mobilization and legal consciousness. Um, and again, you know, a pattern of that in Italy, in, in Matthias's part, how important the NGOs were who decided that the use of harassment to deal with racial, racial harassment would be a, a, a valuable um, kind of legal remedy was terribly important to that kind of emergence of that, um, of that role. Um, and, and then, of course, in addition to that, and just to go back to the first point, which is the internal aspect of legal culture, you know, rules around standing, access to justice costs, all of these had a big impact as well. And if I think about these two big patterns, you know, institutional structures and legal culture, I, I think that if one looked at the kind of in, in all sorts of jurisdictions, common law and civil law, um, you know, uh, developed and undeveloped uh, or developing countries, you would find these are you know, very important to determining whether anti-discrimination law will, will work. But finally, I was um, taken with the, the um, as it were, the parameter of time and how actually over time these, the, the, and that does fit with legal culture, does fit with legal institutions. Over time, we're seeing changes. So again, the account of the changing pattern in Germany, I think gives a sense that although they might be quite uh, varied, you may well see that with the, you know, the strong commitment from the center in the EU, that in fact, um, if we were to have the same conversation in 10 or 20 years time, it might be a very different picture. Thank you. Again. Uh, Helen, we can't hear you. So time lucky, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much um, for that, Kate. Um, and, and Barbara Matisse, I'm very interested in whether you think there is a, 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 an idea of borrowing which exists in um, a lot of European jurisdictions, whether the sense of European integration is important to some of the, um, the patterns that evolve over time, either, either from other European jurisdictions or from other courts um, that have um, their materials easily available like the South African Constitutional Court or the US. You want to go first, Matthias? I just, as a guy, and thanks a lot, first of all, thanks a lot for these in-depth comments uh, for, you know, all, all of you, from all of you. So it's really uh, humbling uh, the way that you speak about our work. So, and the work of our contributors, without them, we wouldn't have been able to draw on all of this rich information so so really it was a collective work in that sense much more than barbara and i sort of doing that on the question of borrowing i'm i wouldn't really use that metaphor 
because interestingly enough, I think for most of them, it was like sort of like it just dropped down into the sort of parachuted. So, so I don't know, imposing might be a slightly different kind of uh, notion, but borrowing wasn't really, I mean, you kind of borrow what you would like to take. And I don't think that many European <laughs> civil law jurisdictions really wanted this it was sort of kind of part of like well we have to take it it's part and part of the acquis communautaire which certainly became much more a, a notion for central eastern european countries that joined later but even the ones that participated sort of in, for the earlier ones let's say 2000 uh, or that it wasn't really that much of a borrowing part from what we've seen so but that's more a comment on the on the on, on whether but again we have these discussions in comparative constitutional law on migration of constitutional ideas or do we talk about borrowing so this is more about about the about the uh, metaphor I, I wouldn't really use that uh, more than that most of the civil law jurisdictions kind of it was like I'm not saying take it or leave it that wasn't the framing of it but sort of certainly for Central Eastern European countries, it was much more of the take or leave it kind of logic that was there than for the original, let's put it this way, Benelux and Italy, France, uh, Germany, where the dynamic was somehow different. Even for Austria, probably, arguably, you might say that, that there was some more participating in the development of the rules than was the case for the countries that joined the EU later on. Uh, so, but again, that was a sort of a reaction, not, not necessarily on, on the question, but giving you a sense probably of how, at least to some extent, the, the arrival of anti-discrimination law was perceived, uh, at least uh, overall. Wow. But sorry, Barbara, maybe you, another... You, you, like... you think that's dangerous yeah. for, 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 for adoption of legal norms if they don't feel um, integral to the development of the legal culture, they feel but... imposed? Well, I was, I was going to follow up on, on Matthias to say mm -hmm. that I think normally when you talk about transplants or borrowing, you think that a country identifies a problem and then looks around to find what law is, is going to suit. What we have here is you get a law and then you slowly start to realize there's also a problem. So, or, or, or you know, or, or you resist the realization, but that is a very specific uh, dynamic. Having said that, I mean, this is what EU law has been doing in a lot of other areas as well as anti-discrimination law. I think it's been particularly contentious in this, in this area. It's, I think it's very touchy. Um, but I, at the same time, it's, I mean, it is dangerous to some extent, but it, it, it is what, part, what the European project partly is, right? That, that some of the decision-making is done collectively. It's not out of your hands, you still have a say. Um, but there's qualified majority voting in the council, and it might so happen that you'll just get a set of rules that you have neither really wanted nor you have you identified the problem, you know, nor are you completely signed up for it. But I, I honestly think that that's just a part and parcel of international cooperation, uh, and not realizing that it is is as dangerous, I think, as potentially this process might be in itself. I mean, Brexit is a perfect example. Right. I, think it's really I wonder whether, Helen, could I, could I intercede on that as well, which is, again, looking at these crisscrossing patterns that in some ways there wasn't that much difference. But for those of us from the UK side, you know, age discrimination just sort of was also quite came parachuting, well, not quite parachuting, much heavier than that. Um, it, it was, um, it, just like Barbara said, not perceived to be an issue for discrimination law at all. And suddenly there, there, there it was. We, the UK government um, negotiated for six years rather than three to get it implemented because it was seen to be such a different thing. And, and I think you would, um, we might all agree that the age discrimination uh, landscape has been a, a very contested one um, in, in lots of different ways all, all, all across Europe. So. Um, definitely when, when aid came along and um, I was involved in a project with Sarah Spencer to even think about what discrimination law meant in the context of aid and Colm, you know, you came in on that project too. Um, so I think again, there's a lot of, it's much, that part of it was as much about the EU project as about difference between common law and, and civil law. Okay. Um I've got, I've, got a, I've got a question in, and I'm going to ask, invite people, um, other participants, to ask questions in the, in the Q&A box, and I'll, and I'll try and um, field them. But I just wondered, Barbara and Matthias, if you had any um, 
observations or, or, or comments on some of the things that the discussants had said or anything that had come to your minds as a result of that? And not necessarily. All I will say is that this really makes me want to do a new book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because there's so much more to talk about some of the things that were suggested by our three commentators. Thank you very much for them. Maybe just a couple of points, maybe linking what Sandy has said with what, what, um, what Kate mentioned on the question of the institutions, but partly, uh, you know, the role of equality bodies and why is it that maybe in the equality bodies as well, the question of intersectionality came up much more than in courts. And that was thinking about as well that the composition, that possibly in the equality bodies, you have more academics sitting in there than in the courts. And that therefore, that, that the composition and the legal training, and that goes back a little bit to the, like, to the question of legal culture. And we haven't really gone into that. I mean, it, it was because then you go into so many different areas, but the training of the people that sit in these institutions actually might tell you more about why intersectionality is more recognized in certain places because in these equality bodies you have experts that are named often from universities and that then bring that knowledge into the institution which isn't necessarily the case in courts where you know these things then take more time because courts look at their own case law or at max you know case law from other countries in a mark but not necessarily at academic literature um, especially not I think the more technical sort of labor courts or civil courts, uh, uh, less so maybe constitutional courts where you get into these broader philosophical discussions. But that was one thought that I had, you know, the kind of training and why is it that in some places you find certain things and in others not. And looking at where people got their training might, might indicate quite a few things. And the other point, this was sort of like what Cole was mentioning about the positive lessons to learn. That was for me in some ways as well, surprising, you know, with coming in with this a priori view, well, it's a legal irritant and they all have problems with it. It was imposed, it wasn't borrowed. I mean, we can take all of that. But then looking at some of the things that work to some extent in certain limits better, I, I was surprised in some ways the quotas. Quotas with a more collective approach seem to be easier to deal with in European, and the disability quota, the disability part by Lisa is really telling. Again, that quotas seem to fare better, actually, in certain civil law countries than the whole discussions that we have in common law and US. And even now we're seeing with the gender quotas discussion uh, coming up that Germany seems to come around to it as well, slowly, but somehow surely. And so that was interesting to me as well to see that, uh, that more this collective understanding of certain things seems to mean that quotas are more possible. And if you look at Central Eastern Europe, okay, it's under a different framing, but there are national minority quotas for reservations for spots in parliaments and universities and where Roma also fit under. Uh, challenged, of course, and I see Barbara going like this, but still they are there in ways that um, certainly Romania as well and Hungary in national parliaments and its national minority framework, but still the quotas seem to have less of a sort of like gut sort of against the individual rights model than seems to be the case at least in common law jurisdiction. So it's just like uh, kind of gut reactions to uh, to some of the comments uh, provided. But, but again, I think the training as well of, of lawyers and this question of legal culture really comes in in many ways uh, that we haven't yeah. even been able to look into. I was going. I was going to um, try and try and weave the questions in as they emerge from the things you've said. But in terms of that issue about culture and the the framing which you bring to something, uh, Mary Kitson has asked whether you find um, bodies with which deal with equality and human rights together under one umbrella organisation um, are more effective. And I was wondering, actually, in, in the context of what you said about intersectionality, if that does provide a slightly different framing, because if you focus it from the sort of human rights uh, dignity discourse, you, you may get to a different place than, from the, than if you look at have you been discriminated against on the basis of a characteristic and in comparison with whom? Uh, the short answer would be that we haven't specifically looked at this and, and because we haven't really done the survey of the individual countries on that point, it, it's very hard to generalize. Um, but I, I think it can go both ways. 
I think, you know, connecting it with human rights can, can get it marginalized or it can get it into conflict with other human rights. Like we've seen in Germany, actually, if you look at the constitutional, some of the constitutional courts, the fact that they have to balance these rights like freedom of contract or business against anti-discrimination and equality law can actually be detrimental. Um, I mean, or it can just, for example, mean that institutionally you have a greater part of a, of a um, institution can be human rights slash equality lawyers. Um, as opposed to, for example, the Czech ombud also has, it, it's a proper ombudsperson for also maladministration, right? So they have a big chunk of work is for sort of bad behavior by public authorities. And the fact that they're doing human rights and equality together just means that there are more people doing that. And that kind of creates a good dynamic in terms of strength of that, those departments together. But it, I, I genuinely think that this can kind of go all ways. And frankly, I think if there's some lesson to be taken from the book, it, it's it, how a lot of these things really are extremely dependent and contingent on sort of quite small things like who's heading an institution, um, uh, you know, funding or, or, or sort of mobilization somewhere where you were not expecting it impacting something else. Um, so it's actually, it's much harder to answer these questions for civil law jurisdictions as, a, as, a, as such than I, I have to admit than I originally expected. Yeah. Maybe just to follow up very briefly, maybe it's more telling to look at whether there were pre-existing institutions rather than was it a human rights institution or was it something else? Because when they, there were pre-existing institutions and that latches on and that creates, again, then it depends on the persons that are leading these new institutions or these revamped institutions. But some of the things that we saw at least was that when there was something pre-existing, it often worked. So Italy, for example, had these consigliere della parità and then that created quite strong sort of gender equality aspects, whereas the race equality body was created from scratch and is not working, is working scratch. So, so that might be more of an indicator than saying, is it a human rights body or is it an equality body that sometimes on the pre-existing uh, institution, there might be more chances that, that this works in a certain way. But again, it's not, it's not, these were just some hunches that we had, that, but more broadly, we try to provide as an, as an input that pre-existing institutions often make a difference in one way uh, of how things then work in practice. Yeah. I mean, looking at some of the institutions that uh, may affect the development of the law and legal culture, I have some questions from Mark Emerton, who's an English uh, employment law judge um, and is involved in some judicial training initiatives with EU judges. And he's um, speculates really on whether one factor in varying judicial attitudes and understanding may be a result of background and legal training. Um, and then he's talked specifically um, in the context of religious discrimination, where he says he's found a very surprising range of attitudes of judges in different EU um, jurisdictions. Um, and he, his perception, and I guess I ask you to comment on this, is that former communist countries um, are often less ready to recognize the purpose of the, the detail of EU, I suppose, individual rights-based um, discrimination law, and others take a more procedural civil code type approach and are, are unwilling to take a purposive approach. So I guess that comes back to your, is this an internalized set of legal norms or is it something you say, well, here's the, here are the rules and we now interpret them. I don't know if you have any views on that or I hope I've summarized those questions fairly, Mark, I have tried. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to say something about uh, Central and Eastern Europe and purposive approaches and, and sort of viewing things in, in context. Uh, and Matthias already mentioned legal education and training is actually a huge topic here. Um, and the fact that uh, legal education in Central and Eastern Europe in the post-socialist countries remains extremely positivistic and inward looking and, and views, views law as this sort of perfect but completely disconnected system from from uh, society, um, I, I think is part of the problem. We don't teach uh, lawyers about reality and uh, about how to understand reality. So it's very hard for them then to go purposive because they don't, they're not taught to see a problem. And then it's very hard to uh, sort of see that the aim of this legislation is, attack, is to tackle a problem that you're actually not capable, frankly, of viewing, of, of seeing, of, of comprehending. 
whether it's on the basis of statistics or whether it's on the basis of individualized stories. Um, if I were to be harsh, I would say a lot of these people disbelieve that there is such a thing as structural inequality or, or systematic biases working against the Roma, especially, but also women. Um, so so it's, it's sort of a, and again, this goes back also to the, the concept of legal culture. Uh, but the short, I mean, your comment is right. Uh, and it also tells me that this is a, a sort of a longer project, especially in the courts, um, because you have people there who are probably not going to massively educate themselves now about, about these things. Um, and this is, and that goes to the question about procedural attitudes to this. This then means that they're very reluctant to decide on merit. And actually in my survey of Czech sex equality case law from ordinary courts, one of the things I noticed is if, these, if, if the judges can kill a case or not decide a case on merit, but can somehow procedurally evade decision-making, they will, which is quite unfortunate obviously for, for claimants. I wonder if Kate or Sandy has any comments about that, thinking about South Africa as another system where there was a very sudden change in legal norms and how legal training and the attitudes and um, habits and experience of the legal profession informed that. So I have a go at that. So I think that um, obviously it was a huge change and everybody knew we were in for a big change. And that meant that across the legal system, there were um, there was a recognition that uh, existing training and so on wasn't adequate. But I do wonder, so the last study I've seen of our equality courts is probably now about 10 years old. And at that stage, there was, given the society we are, our legacy and patterns of racial, um, racist treatment, it, it was really, my sense was that it was being significantly underused. And the, race, the, the equality courts are effectively our lower tier of courts, which we call magistrates courts. Um, at times, higher courts can act as equality courts, but the, the rule is that they don't. Um, and so, you know, we might have some kind of high level judgments from senior courts, but the actual reality on the ground of um, how equality works is, is a very different picture, I think. And that might have to do with, um, that might have to do with legal training. My sense is that it's actually got to do more with the sort of Sally Engel Mary, Mary points about both legal consciousness and mobilization. There's lots of legal mobilization in South Africa, but surprisingly little um, around just sheer issues of race discrimination or for that matter, gender discrimination or age discrimination. So that there is some, but it's not there. A lot of the litigation has been around issues of access to benefits like education or housing, or those uh, kind of social economic uh, goods of those sorts, which are obviously very important and rather less on discrimination. And so I think that, that um, you know, that is one of the considerations. I mean, the cases when I looked at them were a surprising number about hairdressers um, and, and sort of very basic kind of uh, consumer services. Um, uh, len uh, less uh, landlords and uh, tenant were also it was an area where we saw quite a lot but I think the passion on the ground is that there's remarkably little and that's why I was so interested in the equality bodies because I thought probably it's fair to say that our equality court system hasn't been a great success. It may be. I just wanted to add to that Kate um, in the sense that one of the things one of the decisions made was to divide up the labour law apart from the equality issues outside of labor law. So there are now kind of two parallel things, whereas so much of, as I think both Matthias and Barbara mentioned, so much of the, the non-discrimination law, certainly in the UK and in lots of other places, was developed through labor law, and particularly for gender um, equal pay and um, gender discrimination in the workforce. So because there's the South African Labor Relations Act, and then there's Papuja, which is the separate um, Equality Act, which is outside of labor. I feel, Kate, and I'm, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on this, that this institutional structure, which divided things up, has, um, has meant that potentially along the labor law field, there's been more scope for equality issues. But when I was doing um, the, the ILO project in South Africa on equal pay for work of equal value, um, it was very, for, you know, equal paperwork, of equal value was clearly the first thing that the consensus in the EU was that we, you know, we started with Article 119, Treaty of Rome, and then 
in a, in a sense, equality and discrimination or developed from there. And in South Africa, equal pay for, for work for equal value kind of wasn't there. And um, when we when I talked about it to trade unionists and others in the employment field, again, it was more around the collectivity, equal pay for work of equal value as a general issue of fairness, but not as a gender issue and not as a, a question of differential pay as between men and women. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's also your perception, Kate, but I, I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Sandy. And and that since I, I did some work also in relation to the ILO on the on um, uh, garment and textile workers way back in the 90s before I went to the court, and the disinterest in some ways by union, even in a union which is dominated by women, in these issues was was quite surprising. But nevertheless, you're right that some of the stuff we've had has come through the labour courts, um, and very little through the equality court. Mm. I think it's an access to justice point, which you know kind of you know resonates with again some of the pieces in the in the book about actually being able to take your case and knowing you can take your case. Uh, I think we just don't have that level of kind of legal consciousness or mobilisation in this field. Mm. It's very interesting what you're saying about the the relationship, the institutional relationship of equality law to other strands of law like um, labour law. And I did wonder, I'm sorry to, sorry, Sandy, I cut across, I didn't mean to, it's hard on Zoom, but um, I, I wondered, Kate, in, in the light of what you were saying, whether part of the reason was that you have more developed um, rights to, um, to, to seek health or housing and things like that in South Africa, which are very hard to bring in a judicial review in English law, where there's very broad margins of appreciation and very um, rigid sort of constitutional constraints on, or, or institutional perceptual constraints on, on judges getting involved in those questions. So they get litigated through the public sector equality duty plus the Human Rights Act, plus some equality norms that can then be brought in. And, and that's where I think some of the leap came because before that I think Sandy's right most of the institutional expertise and understanding was in the labour law field and there were very few people thinking about equality law outside that field. Um, I, I have a few other um, questions here from participants. Um, uh, Teresa Kim's asked a, a quite a difficult question um, but I'm not going to not ask it because of that in fact it, it maybe I, I should ask it all the more because of that um, about the blurred boundary that sometimes exists between indirect and direct discrimination law, especially in regards to race. Um, and that whereas indirect discrimination law has hidden elements subject to scrutiny, which means it's perhaps harder in some instances, I think maybe institutionally harder to challenge that in, in relation with to a direct discrimination case. And she asks if you know of any examples of how that tension has been resolved in civil law jurisdictions. And she says she looks forward to reading the book. Uh, Mat Matthias, I took the last one, if you want to start on this one. Yeah, I mean, what some of the contributions show is that you're lucky if courts even see it. If courts even see indirect discrimination, whatever you want to call it, I mean, that's the first point. Some courts, as in the French system, start to see in particular the labor courts, but then you have the contribution of Stéphanie and Ed Boucher and Elsa von Limar, who are basically so showing that in the public law courts, in the administrative system and the constitutional system, there's reluctance for different per points, because they're saying, well, at this point, indirect discrimination might be anywhere, might be in all kind of situations, because it affects negatively certain pieces of legislation that seemingly are neutral, could affect racial minorities, could affect women negatively, and therefore, you might need to scratch a whole big chunk of, of a legal aspect. So that seems to be one of these kind of slippery slope arguments that are less present in these more detailed granular kind of forms of litigation but but overall you're lucky if courts see it i mean the greek example as well and and czechia is you know the, it, it's just even getting the point is is one thing and then the next step would be discussing well are certain cases really a case about indirect discrimination uh, the pure forms where you really have no bad intention or no understanding of the legislator developing neutral rules and not realizing that they have such a negative impact on certain groups. That's the pure indirect discrimination cases. But other than that, some other situations where the legislator very well knows what they're doing and just put a neutral wording on it. They do it all the time with regard to Roma, where you know exactly what they're doing. And then at that point, calling that indirect discrimination, I have, but this is my own position with that, I have a problem with, uh, 
And I do think that we can do more. And then it's a little bit of a problem because you seem to bring back intent, but it's a different thing about looking at legislative intent and what the legislator has been doing than looking for intent behind some action that someone commits. So I do think we have the possibilities there, but overall, I think that courts have a difficult time. And I think here as well, I don't think that there's such a difference between common law and civil law courts overall, that indirect discrimination poses certain problems where still there's a lot, a big learning curve to be done uh, on various levels. So, uh, but, but overall, my sense is that, you know, still there's quite a bit of struggle and slowly the employment courts possibly are getting there in some systems with time. Uh, it takes more time in the public law level. Are there any other systems that you're aware of in, in the, in the um, civil law world where there's an equivalent of the public sector equality duty that requires public bodies to seek out and address the discriminatory effects of things that might be ostensibly neutral on their face? Or are you not aware of those? I would say not really. Mm. It's, it, 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 it's interesting. We, we, there's a question here from Amy Gregg, who again thanks you for a fascinating talk. Um, but um, she's talking about the, the range of the spectrum of legal and extra legal reasons that affect whether countries accept anti-discrimination law. And she says, suggests that some of those include pre-existing law, institutional choices and political and ideological foundations. And she asks if you'd say that these things also influence the attitudes and behavior of ordinary citizens in countries and the propensity of citizens to embrace new anti-discrimination laws. Um, or attempt to seek to enforce them, which I think is very, very interesting about the, the sort of normative circle between what citizens perceive to be right and wrong and the law and whether the law informs those attitudes or the attitudes inform the law or the relationship between them. It's, it's a good question. And I think the only reason why we rarely comment on this is that it's just often outside of our disciplinary ability to comment on public, or that's just not what we study as lawyers, right? So, um, I mean, we at most, comment, I think, on, on sort of legal discourses, which we can draw from academic literature and the decisions of courts, be they higher, higher level courts or ordinary courts, sort of trial courts, lower level courts. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, the, if, if you complement that from research by other people in some of these countries, it, it does become apparent that um, this, this kind of hostility that you find in the legal community is, is often sort of a mirror of what is happening in society. Uh, and that there is not a huge support for um, anti-discrimination law. And again, I would draw it back to saying there is not a very good understanding of what certain mon minorities are actually experiencing and going through. I mean, the level of denial of Roma discrimination in employment and housing that you encounter is, I mean, I'm talking especially about Central Eastern European countries, it is just staggering. And it's, it's very hard to be supportive of anti-discrimination law where you don't actually believe the existence of the problem to, to begin with, or, or don't understand what it is, what, it, what, what's, what, what systematic bias and structural mm -hmm. discrimination are. And maybe just to circle back to the question, on the, the, the initial question, one that had been on religious discrimination, I'm not really sure that a lot of that is just happening in Central Eastern Europe. I mean, the debates about this in France uh, around the veil and, and and since the colleague that was asking the question, I think as a judge, I mean, in, I don't think there's any civil law country, at least or European continental country that would allow a judge to wear a headscarf or a turban. So, you know, from that perspective, I wouldn't put that thing on like sort of central eastern backward uh, sort of uh, from anti-discrimination law perspective, because honestly, you know, you have cases over cases in France, of course, but Belgium and and uh, and Germany over the question, not about judges. I mean, I don't think anyone would say like a judge can wear a kippah or it could wear a, a Sikh turban or a headscarf because that would be undermining a certain vision of justice. So I would think on that question of religion and religious discrimination or accommodation, whichever way you want to call it, it's quite evenly spread, possibly together with race and the question of race discrimination, where again, you know, civil law jurisdictions and the history partly of that uh, have led to a fairly evenly spread approach, which then might lead to some actors and NGOs, like the example that I provided for Italy, surprisingly using using it in constructive way to undermine certain of these effects, but nevertheless, 
Uh, so, so I just wanted to circle back. It's not really an answer to the other question, but it was a little bit on this question of religious discrimination that we hadn't really touched upon. But I do think that there we do find relatively similar, um, at least ideas uh, across the board. Well, Matthias, that brings in actually a really interesting comment from Lucy Vickers, who, who has an observation really, she says, rather than the question, which is about differences in legal training. And she has talked about exactly this issue that when you're talking about religion and belief equality in Europe, that's perceived as an aspect of constitutional law about the relationship between church and state, I suppose the great French tradition of enforcing laicism, um, for example. And she says that these lawyers are often not connected with employment lawyers and don't see religious equality as an employment issue. Whereas in the UK, she says church state law isn't a standard subject and most specialists of religious discrimination have come from an employment background and feel more comfortable deciding religion and equality and belief equality cases. And, and indeed that, that's my experience that the equality dress cases in Britain come in the context of employment and also education very much. Education is, is a contested area for religious dress cases here. But um, yeah, so um, let me see how, what else can I fit in. Um, yes, so so um, Suzanne Burry has, again, thank you for the interesting comments. And uh, in, in the context of the um, applying and implementing the concept of indirect discrimination, she's put in the um, Q&A function, um, Jules Mudder's um, thematic, a link to Jules Mudder's thematic report with the European Network of Equality Experts um, in Gender Equality and Non-Discrimination, which is about to be published at equalitylaw.eu. So, that's interesting. And she asks why you think there isn't very much attention for sexual harassment and, and victimization in national and EU law. Do you have a view on that? I, I sort of feel in some ways, I'm not saying obliged because I wrote this surprising use of racial harassment when even Italy is not necessarily known for being very strong on sexual harassment cases. And there all of a sudden you have this mobilization for using those provisions in very, let's put it this way, progressive ways. Some even think, you know, it's it's a danger to free speech. I mean, there's a whole uh, question about that because many of the cases there were about political statements made in public about certain groups. Um, the, the question of sexual harassment, uh, yeah, it, it is puzzling because I do make a difference that in that contribution that that hasn't really taken off as much, uh, at least as those instances that I analyze in in uh, in in Italy and uh, it was a puzzle for me as well so I can just only <laughs> agree with Suzanne that you know the sexual harassment aspect but I do think that harassment really is potentially quite interesting for various you know we talked about religion you know thinking about these headscarf cases coming up and construing them as the question of religious harassment actually would be like because it has a whole set of possibilities you don't look for intent, it has a purpose or effect. Comparator, you don't necessarily need a comparator. So I do think there's a number of ways in which some of these things that are taking place could be actually framed as harassment uh, in a broader way. Uh, and maybe with sexual harassment, there's a lot of insistence on the, on the in, less on the intimidating hostile environment rather than on the intent of the harasser. Uh, that might be some of the issues. But if you take the intimidating and hostile environment part, there should be more uh, more happening there, certainly in the employment context. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I will say that I think this is one of those concepts that have, has not really traveled very well to continental Europe. I think that sexual harassment, especially, is not understood as being about power, but being about sex, and sex is meant to be fun. So I think while like in, in, in many of these countries, much more prominently, especially I'm thinking of France, but elsewhere as well. And so you're, you're again hitting a bit of a conceptual difficulty with how to assess this behavior. Um, and I, th I think sex uh, discrimination is hitting, I mean, I think sex discrimination hits two real big obstacles compared to, for example, race, which is one is that sort of treating people differently seems to be legitimate. Uh, in a lot of quarters because women are seen as different, biologically different, and then consequently socially different. And I think the other one is sexuality, that uh, people are reluctant to, to mess with human sexuality that is again seen as natural, etc. And I think sexual harassment, I, I, and I'm saying this for, for Czechia, but I think this is true in other countries as well, is just kind of hitting this wall of 
but you're going to prohibit us from flirting. And, and, and there is not a sufficient understanding of it actually being abuse of power. That's the problem and not, um, not, not that we are sexual beings and that we act out on that. That's interesting because, because there is some more understanding of that in, in the Strasbourg jurisdiction um, about positive, you know, positive obligations to protect people from certain kinds of treatment, um, read with Article 14. So, yeah, that is culturally interesting. I, I'm going to try and fit in um, people's questions because these are great and informed questions. There are a couple which I think I'm going to try and take together if I can, um, although one of them is framed as a question for Kate and Sandy, but I think they're both questions for you both. So um, one person is asking about linguistic uh, limitations on transplants of ideas um, and saying if someone with, familiar with other European languages sometimes finds it hard to express concepts um, clearly that aren't in English and is that something that that, that that has an impact on the way ideas travel across different jurisdictions and then the other question from Rahul Bajaj which I think was also interesting is whether there's a difference in the way things are adjudicated because of um, in inquisitorial and adversarial systems and whether ideas travel in different ways. So I'm taking those two slightly different questions together, but about the framing of problems. Uh, um, Barbara, Matthias, do you want to? <laughs> uh, I unmuted myself, but really just have a small comment on the linguistic. I think it goes both ways. For example, the Czech language does not have a, a, a word mm. for bias. It also doesn't have a word for agency. Uh, and, and there are a couple of others that across, you know, when I come, come across uh, in my work, and, and, and they often are quite significant gaps because they show conceptual gaps rather than just missing words. But that's kind of a short reaction. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. And I do think language uh, does create certain obstacles as well. So working a lot with race, in English, the word goes I'm not saying easily, but much easier than when you're using it in German and Italian. So razza, rasse really, really has. And, and so being sort of half Italian, half German, uh, it, it really, it re I, I realize as well what difference it makes in using those words. And that can certainly contribute to some of the difficulties uh, in, in mobilizing around certain things that don't make the image of Martin Luther King come up, to put it bluntly, but something very different. So again, so that might, so the language part certainly plays an interesting role uh, in that. So thanks a lot, because we haven't really, but it's again, you know, like partly it's questions of legal culture and culture sort of you, you're, in the book, we say like we go from legal factors to the extra legal ones and probably language is sort of at the very end in a sense and not saying in importance, but playing a certain role. Also in Italian, the word of genere, gender. So gender didn't really, this was Barbara said, genere was a grammatical kind of expression of a word that was either masculine or feminine. So it was a grammar kind of term, but it doesn't mean that words cannot change their meaning. So I think nowadays you start talking more and more about discriminazione di genere. So using that, and I think 20 years further down, some of those critiques are kind of gone. So language also changes and shifts. It can do positively, it can do negatively. And we see how metaphors change or uh, you know, the way that even the European Court of Human Rights was using gypsies, I don't think we would use that language today, or you look at the US Supreme Court where Thurgood Marshall was still using the N-word, or to some extent referring to the Negro, you wouldn't find that language today in the US Supreme Court. So there is shifting uh, part of that. Then you say, okay, you know, it, it provides resistances, but at the same time, language also changes, and these resistances might wane as time goes by. So the importance of time as well, I think is, is, still, is still there. On the question of inquisitorial versus adversarial, I don't necessarily, like one thing that we did see was some of the problems that happened with the criminal law system. So if you have the anti-discrimination law being anchored more in criminal law, which is particularly the case for race discrimination in most of the civil law countries, because partly when they ratified the third convention, they were obliged or introduced some provisions on race discrimination and anchored them in criminal law. And there, the, the problem is simply of a different nature. It's not the inquisitorial versus adversarial, but it's just that in criminal law, indirect discrimination cannot take place. Criminal law requires intent. So indirect discrimination cannot really 
happen there. Um, so, so that creates more of the problem than actually whether it's adversarial or inquisitorial. I mean, we didn't delve into it, so it's, a, it's an interesting question whether that might be one of the variables to take into account in taking sort of like social science language methods, whether that might be one of the variables that could favor or disfavor uh, the spread of anti-discrimination law uh, or not. So we haven't really looked at that, but the criminal law part certainly prevented a number of things from happening more quickly uh, because now what we're seeing is the shift to litigation from the criminal law system to the civil law system via the EU directive has really changed things. France, Italy, certainly that has changed. And you even see it when you just look at the numbers of court. So in France, the shift from the Cassation Criminelle from the French Supreme Court in criminal law affairs to the, the Chambre Sociale of the Supreme Court, so the employment part, has really shifted after the 2000s. So initially you could only find discrimination cases in the criminal Supreme Court and that's pretty much gone. Um, so, so you see shifts taking place in that way because it's easier to litigate and that gets back to the question of access to justice. It's simply easier to do that at least in civil law courts than it is in criminal law courts for sure. Could I just, um, Helen, yeah. yes, sorry. sorry. No, I just wanted to add something to, to the inquisitorial adversarial, just back to equality bodies, because um, we talk about equality bodies, but actually, if you delve a bit more deeply, you find they are very different. They are very different institutions in different countries, aren't they? And um, some of them are do have, um, let's call them decision making powers or, or rather resolution powers to call it broadly and most of those are not on a, any kind of traditional adversarial system so certainly on the intersectionality project I think I did feel doing collating and, and doing that um, project for the EU network of experts that um, that was why they were somewhat more conducive, as well as the training that you talked about earlier, Matthias, but because they had a much more relaxed approach to procedure, much more open-ended ability to um, address evidence, and um, also therefore meant that they didn't have to think in particular silos which come from an adversarial um, approach, which requires a very clear course of action, clear ground, you know, all of that is 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 much more open and therefore much more able to deal with intersectionality. Um, did you were you going to say something on that as well? I was going to very briefly share two anecdotes from around ten years ago that I think illustrate how linguistics, legal training, and cultural background can intersect in a triad of influences to sort of complicate the picture. Um, I once sat through an hour's argument about the burden of proof and what a shift in the burden of proof required. And a lot of the linguistic um, chaos in that conversation, and there was a lot of it, was the distinction between a burden of proof and a standard of proof. Now, all the lawyers in the room will know there's a distinction between a standard of proof and a burden of proof, but linguistically, you start spreading that across um, individuals from like men, many different countries with different language, first, second, third language relationships with English, and you start getting into real complexity. So that's that's an illustration of the genuine difficulties that can arise. Um, and that was a term carried over from gender equality, which just shows you how embedded some of these difficulties are. Secondly, I was once accused of being a racist in a, um, in a conference in Norrköping in uh, Sweden because I was... Um, because in my presentation, I happened to mention that the prohibition on race discrimination included ethnicity. And it was um, by a, uh, a quite prominent Swedish sociologist who argued for the absolute necessity of keeping ethnicity and race as completely distinct concepts. Race being a hopelessly tainted neo-Nazi, Nazi ideology infected idea, ethnicity being a completely neutral to positive concept. And then for him, the concept of race discrimination had to be seen as targeting the expressions of Nazi ideology. Whereas differentiation drawing on ethnicity was quite a different thing. Now that was a sociologist at an interdisciplinary policy conference on how Sweden was going to implement the race equality directive. But I, I use those concepts to sort of, I, I, I use that anecdote to sort of show the complexities of thinking here and how assumptions that in our context, in the Anglo-American context, that race and ethnicity are sort of blurred ideas 
um, if they're seen as radically quite different in different countries, linguistically or methodologically or culturally, then that can very much complicate the conversation just by way of the challenges. But, but Matthias's point is also correct, that over time, terms of art become established. And I've noticed that very much over the last 10 years. Um, I actually wanted to come back on, on the inquisitorial adversarial point as well, and actually following up also on the bur burden of proof discussion. So I think the things that I think we were discussing more, uh, rather than the difference between inquisitorial and adversarial, were um, sort of things that the courts have, that have at their disposal, like the, the shifting of burden of proof, which some of the other institutions that are meant to enforce uh, anti-discrimination law don't. So burden of proof as per the directives is only obligatory in courts. Um, and there is, strictly speaking, no shifting of burden of proof if you have an inquisitorial uh, method in, for example, labor inspectorates in the Czech Republic. But that, uh, but that makes sense, right? Because if you, if you have full inquisitorial powers, you kind of don't really have to have a shift of burden of proof. But the shift of burden of proof is also an intellectual exercise in anti-discrimination law. And it's, it's an evaluative exercise in terms of what you do with the gathered evidence. And we have found that the labor inspectors have real trouble kind of going like, if we don't have any other good reason for interpreting why the decision was made, and, and this is a person of, of Roma origin and, and their race is quite a prominent characteristic, we'll just come to the conclusion that absent any other evidence that this was, this was race. They, they just don't feel that they can do it in a way that if you have burden of proof shifting before a court, you can. So there are these interesting things happening depending i think on on what what, what methods you can employ or not um, yeah so actually that is in the end something about inquisitorial versus adversarial just in a different rank yeah um we've kind of come to the end of our time but i had one little kind of orphaned question on the end which may be the subject of your next book i don't know but i don't want to leave it orphaned on the end because it feels very unfair to the questioner um, um asang wankedi asks you whether the question of how, how the question of anti-poverty discrimination or poverty discrimination is dealt with differently in civil law jurisdictions when compared with uh, the common law, which I suppose, again, brings in the, what is the adjudicative mechanism for something like that that isn't in itself regarded as a protected, ca protected characteristic in EU law. I don't know if you have any brief comments on that um, question. I mean, my quick reaction would be that, um, that the answer is really this more collective attitude to social problems, which means that I think even more so than in, or more so than in common law countries where there is a lot of discussion about how to deal with poverty through anti-discrimination law because you're missing some other tools to deal with poverty. I feel like there is just much more of an assumption this might also prove to be increasingly incorrect in continental countries under the influence of COVID or going back a couple more years financial crisis that poverty will be addressed through the pre-existing uh, setups of redistributive poly social policy. Yeah, just to follow up and, and precisely, so there has been technically in a different bucket. So I think sometimes things are seen in different. So poverty was a question of class, socialism addressing that. And so there's different mechanisms. And that's what is interesting in Lisa Waddington's uh, contribution as well to think about disability quotas. They were not, disability quotas exist in many European countries, but they pre-exist and they came from essentially what she shows is World War I, that this was to address questions of veterans. So we don't conceptually put them into that bucket. So the question of, of poverty or anti-poverty discrimination is sort of like, well, there's other mechanisms. That doesn't mean that countries like France or a number of Central Eastern European countries have a long laundry list of grounds in their national legislation of grounds that are prohibited discrimination and where probably to some extent you find economic status but then litigating that and partly it, it sort of like it, it constitutes a sort of on the one hand you might see it as a dilution of these other grounds because anything and everything is in those laundry lists so it, it, it's sort of like a problem and this is partly what we try to see in some countries it's sort of like overlapping the question of equality with anti-discrimination when you then have these long lists that are difficult even to mobilize in one way or the other uh, but conceptually seem to sit sort of between the lines uh, and between the systems. So, so overall, 
uh, that there's something that we've seen or observed, uh, but most probably in many civil law jurisdictions, poverty is seen as being addressed elsewhere and not via anti-discrimination law in much more collective approaches to uh, social equality uh, that isn't necessarily as much in, in anti-discrimination law. Thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end, more than come to the end of this session, but it has been fascinating and as you can see, have generated a huge number of um, questions and observations and thought, which is, I'm sure, the mark of a very successful um, book, and I hope it goes on doing that. Anyone who wants to re-watch or send to their friends, relations and co-workers the um, link to this discussion will in due course be put up on the Bonavero Institute web page, and I think um, Gatri has put the link um, in the chat. Is there anything else? Oh yes, and also um, the link to where you can register for future Bonavero events, which is a very worthwhile exercise. I can't tell you, um, Barbara and Mateus, how sorry I am that the original plan for this book launch, where we now proceed to drinking wine and eating crisps and carrying on the discussion with interested people is not possible. I hope that we can do that informally um, as soon as the public health situation allows. But I'd just like to thank you um, for um, producing and editing this um, extraordinary interesting and fast, uh, collection and um, the Bonavero for hosting this event and enabling me to um, participate in the discussion and to um, Sandy, um, Cullum and Kate for their contributions as well. So thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.